Hey, I'm so excited to be here with you guys today. Uh, I uh, I love this weather. <laughs> this is also my fault. I prayed for 30 inches of snow on Christmas, okay? Yes, I did. 30 inches. I prayed for it. And God blessed me with just a couple, all right? Uh, so I love this. This is also my fault, and I'll take it every day of the year. But hey, it's New Year, right? Happy New Year. New Year, new me, right? Who's feeling that? New Year, new me, right? Yeah, come on. Praise God. Somebody uh, started a diet, didn't they? I'm not going to make you raise your hand. Don't worry about it. Uh, somebody signed up for a gym membership, I bet, didn't they? Somebody in the house signed up for a gym membership. Uh, I bet there's a lot of things uh, that people have started doing this new year. Why? Because it's a new year, and a new year brings that new feeling, right? Ah, come on, why? It's a breath of fresh air. The f air is so fresh that if you breathe it outside, it literally takes your breath away, right? Leaves you speechless. That's how fresh that air is. Nice. It's beautiful uh, from the frozen tundra of the north. I, uh, this, this new year, I, I love New Year's because it brings that new feeling. It brings fresh resolutions, right? A New Year's resolution. We all say, man, this year, I want this year to be different. I'm going to set new goals for my life. I'm going to do something different than I've never, something that I've never done before. And this is the time I'm going to start working towards that, that resolution, uh, working towards that goal. Maybe this year we're hoping for a new revelation from the Lord, right? This is a great time to start seeking God and say, God, what, what do you want from me? What does 2022 look for me, uh, look like for my life? What, what are you trying to do? Uh, oh, th this new year, maybe it's, it's a want for for God to bring you into a new season, for that season to be better than the season that you were in, the season that you just stepped out of, the season of 2021. A new year, this new feeling, it, it brings new opportunities. But let's be honest for a moment. Let's be honest, right? That new feeling that a new year brings, it never lasts. It never lasts, right? Come February, come March, when the new wears off and we realize that we're still in the same job, we're still living the same life, we're still surrounded by the same people, and everything that we wanted to be different isn't different. And that's where the frustration starts to set in because everything that we wanted to be different, it's all still the same. We wanted our life to change, but for some reason, it's all still the same. This happens every year. And so the gym membership that we signed up for, we just end up paying for and not ever showing up, right? Because it costs more to get out of it than it did to get into it, right? The diet goes off the rails. It, nothing seems to change. That's when resolutions fall apart, goals fail, new seasons turn out to be the same season. It just seems like it's gotten extended and I'm frustrated. And friends, here's why New Year's uh, feels great but never ends great. Here's why new resolutions, resolutions, revelations, resolutions, resolutions is what I'm looking for. See how we did that? I was hooked on phonics, y'all. I can figure it out. Don't worry about me. This is why New Year's resolutions never last. This is why news goals, new goals always seem to fail. It's because we strive and we plan and we try so hard to change the things that we don't like about our lives. We do our absolute best to try and, and we work so hard and, and we try to make these goals and we, we do the best that we can and that's all good and that's all necessary, but we have to recognize and understand that change will never happen in our own strength by trying very hard in our own power. If you wanna change your life, you need to surrender your life to the only person who has the power to change it, and his name is Jesus Christ. When you surrender to Jesus and he fills you with his Holy Spirit who speaks to you, challenges you, convicts you, loves you, the Holy Spirit begins to point you into the direction of Jesus and then gives you the power to walk in step with him. Do you know why your life, your, this season of, of bitterness and anger, this, the, do you know why that continues to extend? It's because we don't surrender it to Jesus and we try to change it on our own. We say, ah, this is a new year. I just want to be a better person. I'm just going to be a good person. I'm going to make better decisions. But we try to do that on our own. And without the power of the Holy Spirit, we can't do it. We have to have a mighty move of God in our lives. We have to surrender our hearts to Jesus and recognize that our lives will not change overnight. 
Your life will not change overnight. But if you follow Jesus through the power of his Holy Spirit, in time you will be able to look back and see all of the ways that he was at work. If you surrender your heart and you begin to follow Jesus, you will be able to look back and see all of the ways that he was guiding you. You will see all of the points, the different moments in your life where you said, yeah, I lived surrender to his plan and his will. And most likely, your life won't look like what you thought it would, but it will be better than you ever imagined because a life following Jesus is the best life any person could ever live. And so a changed life starts with a changed heart, which starts with surrendering to Jesus. And I know what you're thinking, because I thought the same thing. I've been in church my whole life. You've, some of you have heard me tell that story. Some of you have been in church for a really long time. And you say, Pastor August, I've already surrendered to Jesus. Pastor August, I, I've already done that. I've already had my moment at the altar. And what we forget times what we forget at times as Christians, as people who are in church, as people who live the life surrendered to Jesus is that uh, the surrender moment is not one time in the altar, but it's every day. It's every moment that we wake up, we say, God, today is surrender to you. God, my heart is surrendered to you. God, my life today is surrendered to you. Once again, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Once again, speak to my heart, speak to my life, and in this day, what would you have me do that is different than the day before? Why? Because God's mercies are new every morning, and so if he's new every morning, that means you can be new every morning. Oh, come on, church, it's 2022. We should be excited about the opportunities that God is setting before us to see a mighty move in our world and in our lives. Praise God. Like Pastor Jeff said, today we are, we're starting this new series called A Mighty Move of God. And we're kicking it off today and for the next six weeks we're going to be talking about how do we see God move in our lives? How do we see God move in our families? How do we see God move in our church and in our communities? Because if we were being honest with ourselves, we know and we recognize that what this world needs the most is for God to do what only he can do and change hearts and lives and heal brokenness and light up the darkness and bring life into dead souls. We need to see a mighty move of God. This world needs a mighty move of God. This church needs a mighty move of God. Your families need mighty moves of God. This community needs a mighty move of God. Are you with me this morning? Is there anybody in the house that wants to see a mighty move of God this year? So here's where it gets tricky. Because if we wanna see a mighty move of God, we have to be willing to be the mighty move of God. If we wanna see God move in mighty ways, we have to be willing to be the move that God is trying to do in our community. If we, if we wanna see God move in our families, then we need to be the move of God in our families. If we wanna see God move in our workplaces, then we need to be the move of God in our workplaces. Why? Because this is what the Bible says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 13, it says the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free, but we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit and we all share the same spirit. You and I and the person sitting next to you and across the room, we are the body of Christ. And so that means that if we want to see Jesus change lives, if we want to see Jesus heal broken hearts, if we want to see Jesus do miracles in our world, we have to be the ones who introduce Jesus to the world. We are the body of Christ. We are his hands and his feet. If we wanna see Jesus move, we have to be willing to do something. We have to be willing to move. 
The Bible also says in, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 uh, through 16, this is Jesus himself talking to us, to his believers, to his disciples. He says, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Church, we have to be the ones who are willing to live in such a way that the light of Jesus will not shine only through our words, but also through our actions. When the Bible, when, when Jesus says, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, he's, he means let the way you live your life be a magnet for people to be attracted to me. Let the way that you live your life attract people to Jesus. Because if we want to be, if we want to see a mighty move of God, we have to be willing to live a life that draws people to Jesus. We are the carriers of his Holy Spirit. We are the carriers of his light. You are the light of the world. You are the body of Christ. If we want to see Jesus move in mighty ways, friends, we have to be dedicated. And we have to be willing to live it out. John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. This is, once again, Jesus talking to his disciples, his believers, to us. He says this. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. You want to know what's going to begin a mighty move of God in this community? When the people who follow Jesus begin loving people. You want to know, you want to know how to see Jesus change your, your workplace, your neighborhood, your family? Start loving people sacrificially the way that Jesus loves you. Start giving your life sacrificially so that people would know how much Jesus loves them. Because that's what we were called to do. To live a righteous and holy, holy life that knows the love of God will therefore display and express his love to all people. And that's the moment when a broken and dying world will begin to see Jesus in us and they will be drawn to him. Church, when we love people because we're daily experiencing God's love for us, we are being his hands and his feet. We are being the body of Christ to our families and to our workplaces and to our church and in our communities. Church, if we want to experience a move of God, we have to be willing to be the move of God. And that's what we're going to talk about for the next six weeks. And my point today is simple and it's easy. To be ready to be a move of God, we have to be prepared to answer the call that he gives to all of us. The call to, to reach out to lost people. The call to love our neighbors. The call to be his hands and his feet. The call to be the body of Christ. And the first thing we need to do to be able to answer the call is to be still and know that he alone is God. Be still and know that he alone is God. This morning we're gonna read all of Psalms 46. Don't worry, it's only 11 verses. Praise God for short Psalms. But this is what it says. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are in chaos. 
and their kingdoms crumble. But God's voice thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Come and see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored in every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. And then I love this part. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Be still and know that I am God. Friends, before we can do anything, we have to know who God is. I love that it says the God of, uh, the God of Israel is our fortress. Do you know what a fortress is? A fortress is, is a protected uh, city where people could wait for the battle to be over and they would be protected. A fortress was where the people, uh, while, the, while the battle was raging, while the army was going out, the people of the city would stay behind the walls of the fortress and they would be safe. They would be still. God is our fortress. We have to know who he is. We have to be still and know that he is God. We have to take so we, we have to uh, take protection and take fortress in him because he is our fortress. So we have to learn what it means to be still in his presence. We have to learn what it means to know that he is God. And friends, that takes time. And we live obviously on the other side of the resurrection and so we know that what that means is that we have to be filled with his Holy Spirit. We have to take time out of our day, every day, to read the word like the Bible reading plans that, that Pastor Jeff was talking about, to read the word, to get to know God, to be still and allow him to move and allow him to do what we can't do. We have to be who God is, is leading us to be, to be the person that God created us to be. We first have to recognize who he is and, what we, and we have to know what he is calling us to do. We have to be still and know that he is God. Friends, you have been placed exactly where you are in this moment of history for this time. And you have a purpose your life has a purpose, and God has a plan for you right here and right now, and that plan is unique to who you are. I cannot execute the plan that God has for you. Pastor Jeff, Pastor Weaver, and none of the pastors here, we, none of us can execute the plan that God has for your life. None of us can execute the purpose that God has for your life. I cannot live out your God-given purpose. You and you alone are God's plan A for the family that you're a part of. You are God's plan A for the coworkers that you're with every day of the week, for the neighborhood that you live in. You are plan A. You are God's chosen. And he, all you have to do is follow him and be still and know that he is God. Know the plan that he has given you. Know uh, where he is leading you and follow him there so that you can reach a lost and broken and dying world. So that you can execute what God is calling you to do. We're all working together for the same common goal with the same common spirit of God. We all have the same purpose in mind to reach lost people and, and see Jesus change the world. But you have a unique plan. He has a unique purpose for your life. He wants you, he wants to use you to change your world. And it all starts with your heart knowing who Jesus is. And that takes time. So my question this morning is this, what are you giving your time to? What are you giving your time to? If we were to take an honest assessment of our day, and thankfully most of us have smartphones and this will tell us exactly what we're giving our time to. What are you giving your time to? Because if you wanna see a mighty move of God and you give more time to your cell phone than you do Jesus, friends, I'm telling you, he's not gonna move in the ways that you want him to move. 
If you want to see a mighty move of God and you're giving more time to Netflix or, or sports or whatever it may be in your life than you are to Jesus, friends, he's not going to move in the ways that he wants to. He's not going to move in the ways that you want to see him move. I've always told my students this very simple statement. If you fill yourself with trash, then what's going to come out of you will be trash. But if you fill yourself with Jesus, then what's going to come out of you will be Jesus. What are you giving your time to? What are you filling yourself with? What are you filling your heart with? From the moment of creation, God has been moving. I love when we say we want to see God move. We want to see a mighty move of God. Friends, God's been moving since creation, and he hasn't stopped. God has never stopped moving. So when we ask God to move in our lives and in our own little worlds, what we're really asking is for God to let us join his movement. We're asking for God to let us join into what he's doing. You know, like an escalator never stops moving. It's always going. It's always climbing. Like the, the, the movers at the, the flat movers at the airports, like they never stop moving. All we have to do is just take a step onto it and join the movement. So the same is with God. God has never stopped moving. When we ask for fresh revelations, for healings, for miracles to happen, we're not asking for God to do something that he's never done before. We're just asking that God would take us there with him. We're asking to join the movement, praying, God, we already know because of your word that your will is for every heart to know you, for sickness to be healed, for brokenness to be made whole, for darkness to be eradicated with the light of Jesus Christ. So because we already know what you want to do because of what you've already done, we are asking that you take our surrendered lives. Let us join you on the journey and use us to change the world. It's a heart that says, here I am, Lord. I'm yours. Use me for your glory and for your good. And that may look like miracles, but that also might look like sitting at high V and having breakfast with hurting people. That may look like going out of your way to shovel off your neighbor's driveway. But no matter what, it looks like humble obedience to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so this morning, I'm going to close with a part of the story of Exodus. Ian and worship team, you guys can get ready to come. The Israelites, we, if, you, if you don't know the story of Exodus, I want to challenge you to do a couple of things for me. And today is a perfect day to do that because it's way too cold to do anything outside. Number one, go home and read the story of the Exodus. It's powerful. God moves in mighty ways. And if we want to see God move in mighty ways here and be the move of God that you know, we need here, we, we need to know what he's done. So first and foremost, read the story of the Exodus. Secondly, uh, you can watch the story of the Exodus in two great films, okay? Fantastic films. Number one, Prince of Egypt. Some of you are like, I've never heard of the Prince of Egypt. But it was a cartoon story for me, and it was fantastic. Number two, my, one of my favorite movies of all time is Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments, okay? It's a great film. So you can read the stories, you can watch the stories, and it'll change your life. It's fantastic. But here's a quick paraphrase of what's going on before we pick up the story. The Israelites are on their way out of Egypt, and they stopped and they camped before the, the Red Sea, and the Egyptians were in hot pursuit. And this is where we're going to pick up the story in Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 through 12. It says this, As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We told you, Moses, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. God is literally moving on their behalf. God is literally moving them. But when people can't see what God is doing, they panic because what they're looking at is far greater than what they can handle. And we all know the verse, God will never give you more than you can handle. That's true. 
but only if you have the Holy Spirit in your life. Only if you know God's word. Only if you stand in faith on his promises full of his Holy Spirit ready to take on the world. Because there will all, you will always stare down an enemy. You will always stare down a storm. You will always stare down a situation that will be far more than you can handle. But it will never be more than your God can handle. And the Israelites are staring at an enemy that will surely overtake overtake them and ruin them. What the Israelites were looking at was angry slave masters coming back for their property. They were afraid, they were powerless, and they were ignorant to the word of the Lord. They were ignorant to the word of the Lord. But then the story goes on in Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 through 14. Moses told the people, Don't be afraid, just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you, just stay calm. Another version of the Bible says you need only to be still. The Lord will fight for you, you need only to be still. Church, when we know who God is, and we have his word in our hearts. We can trust him no matter what, no matter what we are seeing around us, no matter what storm we're facing down, no matter what enemy is closing in around us, we can trust him that no matter what, when we know the word of the Lord, we can have confidence and we can be calm. No stress, no anxiety, no despair, no matter what, why? Because our God is a God of peace and he will never forsake his people. And those who believe in Jesus and Father Follow him with our hearts and our lives. We'll know his faithfulness and his goodness and we'll see him come through on our behalf. We need only to be still and know who he is. That takes time. That takes time. It takes time for you to sacrifice your comfortabilities to know God. It takes time for you to reset your routine and set aside time to pray and spend time in his presence and spend time being still. It takes time for us to say, I am dedicated to you, God, because I wanna see you move in mighty ways and therefore I will be the move that you are asking me to be. And so I will spend time in your presence being still away from distractions, away from all the problems that I see around me, God, and I will focus on you and I will know that you are good. I will know that you are faithful. I will know that you love me and I will know your promises. I will know your word. so I will stay here until you tell me to go. I will be still and I will know that you are God. And then when we are in a routine, in a habit, in a lifestyle of being still in his presence and his spirit fills our hearts and his spirit takes our fear and replaces it with his peace and his patience and his confidence and his boldness, the spirit will tell us when it's time to take the next step. And that's my favorite part of this story because in Exodus chapter 14, verses 15 through 18, the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff, raise your hand over the sea, divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. They will charge in after the Israelites. My great glory will be displayed through Pharaoh and his troops, his chariots and his charioteers. And when my glory is displayed through them, all of Egypt will see my glory and know that I am the Lord. When we are dedicated to his word and we follow him and we do what he's asking us to do, when we take our moment to be still in his presence and know that he is God, he will say, now it's time for you to take a step forward and allow my glory to be displayed in your life. Because when my glory is displayed in your life, the world will see it and they will know that I am God. Friends, Right now, 
we are staring down the barrel of a new year, a new year full of great potential and great opportunities. And I believe that we are at a moment of choosing. Do I want to join God in his movement? Or do I want to try and white knuckle my way to the life that I want? Would you stand with me this morning? I'm gonna ask you to respond as we close, to respond with God to what God is doing today. A changed world first requires a changed heart. And the only way to change your heart and your life is to once again, maybe for the first time or for the millionth time, surrender to Jesus. And so if you want to see God move in mighty ways this year, in your life, in your family, in your workplace, in your co-workers, in this church, in this community, I'm telling you, it's going to start with you taking time to be still in his presence and know that he is God, he is good, and he has a plan. It's going to start with you in a moment of stillness and surrender, being filled with his spirit and making that an everyday routine. And so I'm challenging you to start now. I'm challenging you to start in this moment. If this year you want to step into God's movement, if this year you want to be a part of the mighty move of God, then right now, in this moment, in an act of surrender, I challenge you to find a spot at this altar and say, God, here I am. Show me your glory. Show me who you are and how you want to use me. Show me the things that I need to get rid of. Show me the places that I have yet to fully surrender. Here I am, Lord, in stillness and surrender. Move in me so that I can move for you. If that's you, respond now and begin having a conversation with Jesus as we worship him today. I just want Jesus this morning. It's all about you. God, this morning we want to see you move in mighty ways. And so we are willing to be the move of God. We are willing to be your hands and feet. We are willing to be your body in our communities. To be your light and shine it in the darkest places. So God, this morning we ask that as we surrender to you once again, Maybe for the first time or the millionth time, God. But as we surrender to you this morning, we ask that you would use us. Use us as tools for your glory. Let the world see your glory and your goodness and your faithfulness and your love through us, God. Let our lives be all about you. So that we can shine your light in the darkness. So that we can be the move of God that you are asking us to be so that we can be the move of God that we want to see in our families, in our homes, in our communities. Jesus, we need you. First and foremost, we need you. You are the greatest gift of all. God, we need you to move. We need you to move in our hearts and in our lives. And we need you to use us to move in our communities. Jesus, we love you, we praise you. It's in your mighty and holy name we pray. Everybody said, amen. I got a few closing thoughts and then I'm gonna dismiss you. It's a 10 point sermon, so just stay here. Just kidding. But if we wanna see God move in mighty ways and we wanna be the move that God, that we wanna see, we wanna be the move that God is calling us to be, we need to dedicate ourselves to daily reading our Bible and spending time in his presence, conversing with him through prayer. We need to dedicate ourselves to spending time with people who push us towards Jesus and don't pull us away from him, right? Coming to church, joining a small group, going to a Sunday school class, Sunday night services that we are gonna dedicate to spending time in his presence, serving somewhere in this church body. And lastly, we need to be dedicated to stepping out of our comfort zone and showing the world the hope and life and love that we have found in Jesus Christ. Are you with me this morning? 
Amen. I expect to see all of you here tonight, 6 p.m. for Sunday night service. Love you guys so very much. We'll see you tonight.